Okay. Welcome, welcome, Sally. Uh, welcome, Temple University Japan campus. Uh, um, just a few things. If you have a mobile phone, uh, put it on um, vibrate. Um, if um, you want to quote the participants of the, of the record, so ask them if they want to be quoted and know that they're speaking on their personal behalf, not on behalf of the organizations for which they work or do research for. Um, so first, um, we'd have Ben, who will sp speak about, give us a few uh, takeouts from the election. Uh, afterwards, Guillaume will brief us on what the new president means and on En Marche. And uh, then Regis, uh, is uh, writing his speech, actually. Uh, and we are sure it will be like Pericles' funeral oration, something we will read. 25 centuries from now. Uh, so they'll each will speak for about 25 minutes, and afterwards uh, we'll have a discussion among the panelists and open the discussion um, for uh, to the floor. Uh, and again, if you didn't get also if you didn't get an email from us, uh, let me know and give me your business card or give any of my colleagues your business cards, and we'll add you to our email list. And as you know. Uh, these events are free, but they're not cost-free, so you're encouraged to make a donation to our donation box. Uh, they're not compulsory yet, but we're thinking about it. <laughs> so thanks again. Um, so I think the floor is yours, and uh, we'll start with Benjamin Lasry, who's in London and who's kindly agreed uh, to brief us through the wonders of modern technology. So Ben, I think the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Robert. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk about the French election results, and then we can go into more detail in any of the issues uh, covered during the, the panel discussion. So the first point I'd like to make is that um, it, it's important to bear in mind that this was an unprecedented election by many accounts. Um, in his final months in office, outgoing socialist president François Hollande was the most unpopular president in the history of the Fifth Republic. This election essentially should have been a very easy win for the Républicains, the Conservatives. And it seemed to be the case until um, François Fillon, their candidate, became embroiled in a series of financial scandals involving his wife and two of his children. This is also the first time in the history of the Fifth Republic that both candidates of the major parties are eliminated in the first round. So François Fillon, the Conservative candidate in the bottom right corner, and Socialist candidate Benoît Hamon. The, um, as, as Guillaume will explain in more detail, uh, the victor of this election was also a surprise and uh, uh, not predicted by anybody um, a year ago. A 39-year-old who had never been elected to public office, who created his movement en marche a year ago. And um, the consequence of this is that we're now seeing a new four-way fragmentation of the French political landscape, which is nothing like anything we had ever seen before. I put pictures up there on the first slide um, of Marine Le Pen, obviously, in the top left corner, um, far left candidate Jean-Luc Mélenchon, um, in the bottom left corner, um, Emmanuel Macron, obviously, in the top right corner, and conservative François Fillon. The question is, what does this election mean for the world and for the European Union? Now, 2016 was obviously marked by Brexit, by the election of Donald Trump, and many predicted or feared that this populist wave would kind of take over and spread across the continent, and that we would have a domino effect with um, the European countries being knocked down one after the other. But actually what's interesting is that we're seeing precisely the opposite with the Austrian election in December 2016, so after the election of Donald Trump, um, the election in Holland in March this year, now the French election, each and every one of those countries is electing pro-European leaders. We're actually not seeing a domino effect with the populist wave taking over the continent. What we're seeing is um, a domino defect with Britain uh, appearing to be the only country right now leaving the European Union, which is good news for the Euro and for the EU. On this issue of the uh, comparisons with Brexit and with Donald Trump. Now, there are certain points um, in common between, on the one hand, the kind of Clinton-Macron vote, and on the other, the Brexit-Trump-Le Pen vote. 
if you look at um, factors such as education level, geography, um, how voters reacted in terms of gender. But what's interesting to note is that un unlike Brexit and Trump last year, older voters actually went against the populist option. If you look at the Leave voters and the Donald Trump voters, a majority of the 65 plus went for those options. In France, what we saw is that they went for Emmanuel Macron. And part of the reason is because Le Pen's back and forth on the euro, saying one day that she would definitely leave the euro, then backtracking, then trying to find a compromise position um, that she was unable to explain very clearly. This created a lot of fear um, for a large portion of the electorate who realized how threatening this was for their savings accounts. The geographical divide is also an interesting factor. The first map on the left shows the departments where the candidates came out ahead in the first round. So there were 11 candidates in the first round. In black is where the FN, Front National, so Marine Le Pen's party, came out ahead. There's clearly a kind of French version of the Rust Belt spreading from the Northeast and even extending towards the Southwest. These are mostly deindustrialized de regions, um, people who have suffered from uh, globalization, who have not reaped the benefits that big cities have had in globalization. In fact, the only two departments where Le Pen came out ahead in the runoff against Macron were departments in the north. Macron performed extremely well in regions that have traditionally been socialist, in Brittany, for example, in the southwest, and we'll see in a, in a second that he had a very strong advantage in, um, in big cities with highly educated voters as well. So to continue this, um, this, uh, this explanation on the geographical divide, this is a map showing on the left-hand side Le Pen's share of vote in the second round and on the right, unemployment. So again, the correlation is, is pretty clear in terms of this kind of rust belt in the Northeast. There are obviously some exceptions. Um, the Department of the Pyrenees Atlantique in the South, which can be explained by local political factors, but broadly there's a, a correlation that's, that's undeniable between, the, um, between unemployment and a vote in favor of, of Marine Le Pen. So Emmanuel Macron, and again, Guillaume will be the, the expert on this, had a, a lot of advantages um, uh, going for him. One of them was what I called his urban firewall, which is his very strong performance in large urban centers. To give you some, um, some examples of this, he performed um, in 14 cities of more than 100,000 inhabitants. He got more than 60% of the votes. In Paris, in the runoff, he got over 90% of the votes. And in big cities like Rennes, Nantes, Bordeaux in the southwest, he got 85% of the votes in the runoff and sometimes even more. So again, there's a very strong correlation with education levels in these big cities. Regarding the chart on the right, this is maybe something we can look into in a bit more detail during the discussion. There's some interesting dynamics in terms of vote transfers, how voters in the first round uh, voted in, in the runoff. And, and this is something we can, we can explore, particularly in terms of uh, the Fillon and, and Mélenchon voters, which has some interesting electoral subtleties. So if Macron's vote is extremely strong in urban centers, for Marine Le Pen, it was the opposite. She had very strong support in rural France. This graph um, shows on the, so on the horizontal axis, it's the size of the city going from um, about zero to, to 20,000 inhabitants, and on the vertical axis, the share of the vote. So in towns of fewer than 3,000, 2,000, 1,000 inhabitants, she performed strongly. But essentially what this chart shows is that the bigger the city, the fewer the votes for Marine Le Pen. In fact, the only cities where she had scores above 80% were, were towns of fewer than 200 inhabitants. This is also interesting because it vindicates um, a thesis by a real estate expert and geographer called uh, Christophe Guilly, who speaks of uh, peripheral France. And this thesis is essentially the idea that these forgotten territories outside big cities 
which have not reaped the benefits of globalization have kind of become cauldrons for populist discourse and identity related tensions. And those are specifically the kind of small town rural areas um, which uh, are giving the National Front a lot of its support today. So one of the questions is, um, of course, Macron clearly defeated Marine Le Pen with 66% of the votes, but why didn't he get more? Why um, in 2002, Jacques Chirac, the center-right candidate, faced Jean-Marie Le Pen, Marine Le Pen's father, in the runoff? and he got more than 82% of the votes. So how did we go from a center-right center candidate getting 82% of the vote to a moderate candidate getting only 66? Well, there are a certain number of factors. I've just listed some of them, some of them but we can um, explore these in, in greater detail. The first one is that Marine Le Pen has done a very impressive job at um, what she calls de-demonizing her party, which is, which is essentially making it more acceptable to mainstream voters, getting rid of the kind of anti-Semitic rhetoric that was uh, very apparent with her father. The second reason is that the far left candidate, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, was uh, extremely ambiguous in the runoff. In 2002, when Jacques Chirac faced Jean-Marie Le Pen, he clearly called to vote in favor of Jacques Chirac, um, whereas in 2017, his position was that he didn't actually publicly declare whether he would be casting a blank ballot or vote for Macron in the runoff. But the conservatives, the Républicains, were also split and didn't really know how to react to this runoff. On the one hand, you had moderates who were clearly, uh, conservative moderates, clearly calling to vote in favor of Macron, saying that the ultimate enemy of the Republic is Marine Le Pen and she had to be blocked and the Macron ballot had to be cast in the runoff. And on the other hand, um, on the other side, you had hardliners who had spent the entire campaign referring to Emmanuel Macron as Emmanuel Hollande or Hollande Junior, who had essentially portrayed him as the mere continuity of Francois Hollande and who were, who were reluctant to call on their supporters to cast a ballot for Macron. Another aspect is abstention, which was extremely high. Abstention uh, was 25.4%, and it was actually the highest abstention level since uh, the 1969 presidential election. And um, the th thesis on that is that abstention would essentially favor the Front National because its supporters are a lot more galvanized than, than other supporters. And I'm just going to finish on this slide um, to uh, again draw a further comparison with uh, 2016. 26, in 2016, uh, pollsters were very fiercely criticized for uh, not telling us more clearly or not telling us at all that the Leave vote would win in the UK and that Donald J. Trump would become the next president of the United States. And thankfully in France, the uh, polls were were more accurate. So I would uh, simply finish this presentation by saying that in France in 2017, it was not just the victory of Emmanuel Macron, the victory of Europe, the victory of globalism, but it was uh, also the victory of French pollsters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benjamin. So now we'll have... Uh, Guillaume, and uh, we'll put on your PowerPoint, hey, Guillaume. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Benjamin. So, unlike Benjamin, I have, uh, I have absolutely no background in politics um, until uh, six months ago. I'm an engineer by, uh, by education, and I've worked more than uh, 30 years in the industry, mostly in the auto industry. Uh, I've also worked for a consulting firm, and now works for software, still uh, very much focusing on uh, mobility. Uh, as uh, I see some uh, some people, some you know friendly face I see in the in the audience. So it's um, I'm just going to describe what I've experienced as my first uh, first uh, political experience in my life, uh, which uh, at the beginning you know they told me it would take 20 minutes per week. I think at the end it took me 20 minutes per quarter an hour uh, to <laughs> to take care at least during the night, <laughs> and uh, because we have, because with the the time difference, you know, of course, all the meetings, all the things took place during the night. So uh, you can ask my wife, I've not slept a lot uh, during the last six months. 
So what uh, the first thing I want to maybe to to mention, this was a kind of very very special adventure, uh, because we were not uh, many, as Benjamin explained six months ago, to believe in uh, in the you know in the chance of uh, of uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron uh, to be to be potentially el elected. And uh, well, actually, at that time, everybody said he could not be elected. So what uh, you know, it wasn't known until uh, until. Uh, two years before, because uh, until he became in August 2014 uh, Ministry of uh, Economy. Uh, he was uh, at that time 38 years old, so in incredibly young. Uh, he was not supported by any established party, as Benjamin explained. He had never competed in any, any political election, so he, he was a kind of, uh, uh, you know, without experience in, the in political life. He had worked for a bank, which I can tell you in France is uh, almost the, the worst thing you can think when you when you want to do politics, and especially when the, the name of the bank is Rothschild, which uh, is very a symbol of uh, I would say very rich people, and uh, and he was ministry he was the minister of economy during two years under the most unpopular president of the Fifth Republic, so he had everything you know to be elected. Uh, next, please, and and most oh, um, maybe I yeah maybe I can. Uh, Okay, I can change normally. Yeah, no. No, I d uh, it's blocked. So I will have to. Okay. So and uh, and most people agreed. So most people agreed, either because uh, they wanted to agree, or well, or be because they really agreed, or because they wanted to agree. They didn't want him to succeed because obviously, he was a kind of a. A kind of dog in the I don't know how you say, but he was uh, basically uh, bothering many people. So people called him, you know, he's a banker, he's a bubble, uh, he, he, yeah, he's the puppet of large corporations, uh, he's a marketing gadget, he's, uh, em you know, as they say, Emmanuel Hollande or or François Hollande's spiritual son. He was created by media. He has no program. He's vague. Is weathercock. I, I don't know if you say weathercock in English, but you know weathercock is girouette in French. You know it means he, yeah, weather vane. So he changes his mind depending on the on the wind. He has uh, he, he agrees with everyone. You know they always say et en même temps and at the same time. So he was saying something and at the same time the opposite. So that makes people you know just kind of crazy. And he was uh, too young. He was never elected. So everybody said anyway. It's not it's not going to last. And uh, and uh, and basically the polls when he so so he declared to be candidate in November, that was the poll at that time, uh, a poll I found. So there were many many other polls, but more or less, you had uh, Marine Le Pen, François Fillon between 25, 24 to 31. When you know, they were at some point Marine Le Pen even had 29 uh, percent, which means that in terms of intention, you know, she finished. You see, at the second round with 10.6 million people voting for her. At some point for the first round, they were sh she had more than, than 11 million people who said they would, they would vote for her, which shows how much uh, she, she lost during the, the campaign. And Francois Fillon, uh, just after the primary of the, of the right and the center, uh, was very popular. And, uh, and of course, the Penelope Gate was a big, big, big problem for, for him, but, but actually his, uh, his popularity has started to decline even before. And Emmanuel Macron was, was very far, like 14%. So this, this was just like uh, less than six months ago, huh? or let's say five months before the election, and the socialist uh, nine percent end up uh, even even less. So if you look at the the actual result, so Emmanuel Macron could uh, at the first round, Emmanuel Macron could uh, could gain ten percent. Marine Le Pen, as I explained, she lost three percent, but in reality she she lost more than that compared to to her peak. François Fillon uh, lost a lot, and uh, and uh, and Mélenchon. And uh, so you can see that the, the two candidates that, that um, who, who really gained were the two that didn't have a real organization, political established organization. Uh, FI means uh, France Insoumise, it's a kind of extreme left uh, uh, type of, uh, of uh, movement. So I made the, the four and f 405 days of Macron's history. <laughs> so since uh, the 6th of April 2016, at that time, he had no party, so he established his party a little more than a year ago, uh, called En Marche. So um, I don't know, walking forward. I don't know how you can say in English. 
his first meeting was in July in front of 3,000 supporters. Um, in summer, he asked uh, the workers, I, I will explain later, because it's uh, walking forward, so the, the supporters are called the workers, the people who walk. And those workers went to ring the bell of people and start interviewing people in, in France and made the diagnosis of, uh, of France from the, from the bottom up. In August, he resigned from government. Uh, in September, he, he, he got the threshold of 100,000 adherents, people who, who were members of the, of the party. He declared he will run for presidency in November. Uh, a week later, he published his book, Revolution, in which he explained his, uh, his vision. And vision also based on the, on the diagnosis, was which was made earlier. In December, he had uh, a meeting in Paris with 15,000 supporters, which was so far the, the biggest uh, political meeting. And, uh, and people <laughs> were very surprised that he could, he could organize that with such a young organization. F in January, for the first time, uh, one poll suggested he could pass the first round. Uh, and uh, in February, he got the 200,000 threshold. In March, he presented his program under pressure. He didn't want to present a program, actually. He said, vision is enough, program is, uh, is, tec is too technical. You know, that's not why what you are elected for. But under pressure, he presented his detailed program. In April, he, he got the first position of the first round. And, uh, and he got 66%, uh, so two-thirds of the ballots on the 7th of May. And now I think there are 350,000. It was 300,000 at that time. And the uh, government should be approved today, in 30 minutes or so, uh, with uh, one third uh, socialist, one third center and right wing politician, and one third from civil society. So in just uh, a little more than a year, he, start, he, he, he came from no nothing to having, you know, kind of government, you know, being largely elected and government. Uh, of a kind of a, a majority, you know, gathering people from uh, from all horizon, horizon. And his approach, and that's something that really uh, interested me, it was a re pretty much a combination of bottom-up and top-down. So as I explained, during last uh, last summer you had these uh, those interviews, 35,000 people were, I think it was 35,000, then he did the diagnosis. Based on the diagnosis, he established his vision. And based on the vision, there were, uh, in many committees, workshops. There are 3,000 committees in France and on the broad. And uh, based on the workshops, he, he established his program. So it's, uh, today, it's uh, actually En Marche has become the biggest political organization in France by the number of, uh, of people who are, who are member more than 3,000 local committees. I was not in France, but I, I heard it was absolutely incredible in Paris and last week. There were meetings about uh, everywhere. He has an incredible organization. I visited their, their, their premises in Paris. And that just, just achieving that is a kind of a very impressive. And, uh, and just to tell, just last week, last two weeks, there were 1,000 events every day on a daily basis in France, so which means uh, 10 per department. Uh, which are either uh, meetings or people, in, you know, going gathering in the street or, or, or whatever. And, uh, and he had 17,000 people who spontaneously candidated for, for the next parliamentary elections, uh, based on which uh, there are 577, con you know, uh, member of parliaments, based half of them will come from the civil society and are going to be selected or have been selected among those uh, 17,000. So just to show you that it's an incredible, uh, an incredible story. Uh, so in Japan, well in Japan, uh, so uh, with two with two friends we founded in October uh, the committee. So very very recent. Actually now we have three committees: uh, one in Kyoto, one in Nagoya. We have 70 members, which I think for that's not the members of the party; that's the member of the committee. So you have to go through two steps. I think the member of the party is about twice as much as that. So which represent 1.4% of the electors of Tokyo who are member of our committee. And, uh, and very interesting, we have some people who come from different political horizons. Some were candidate in the past for socialists, some were candidate for you know, Republican. And those people who have been fighting against each other are now, you know, we are all member of the same, of the same organization. 
Many people have, had never done any politics, like me, but for the first time, we are really motivated to, to engage into politics because I think there are, there are two reasons. One probably was the fear of, uh, you know, fear of not having, you know, somebody like uh, uh, maybe Donald Trump or Brexit or so not going in, into that direction, not, not having uh, uh, France going back to going back to more protectionism. And but the second is that many people told us for the first time, somebody is really speaking to me. It's not kind of posture. It's not a kind of political uh, 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 speech. It's really a speech that I can recognize myself on my opinion into. So I think that's uh, that's very very interesting, and we had a very high level of motivation. In total, we held uh, 20 meetings in Tokyo, which is more than all the other all, all the other candidates combined. Uh, I think that maybe the other candidates combined was less than 10, and in total we had 180 people who have uh, either members or or supporters. We ended up in Tokyo, like in all big cities, having. Uh, uh, much higher uh, score for Macron than than in than the average of France. Uh, the first round was 41 percent against 24, and the second round was 91 percent uh, against 66. So it's almost, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't say the almost the totality, but it's a big big majority. But I think in big cities, Paris was also about about the same. So all the big cities, so as uh, Benjamin explained, it depends also pretty much you know, on the level of education. You don't have many French workers or peasants, or so we are, we are pretty much uh, not representative in here in Tokyo of the, of the average French uh, population. So why, why Macron? Uh, I think there are three reasons, and that's maybe the, the summary of what the people, you know. We always started like uh, the meetings by everybody introducing himself and explaining why he was there and why he was attending the meeting and why he was supporting Macron. And if I summary, there were three reasons. The, the first reason is really a reformation of political life in France. The second reason is uh, what I call integrative thinking. It's not right or left, but it's the best of the right and the best of, of the left. And the third one, he was the only one to really have a program for 21st century. You know, we spoke about globalization. And, and I'm going to go back very, very quickly into the, the detail. The, the first thing, I think, you know, we have seen that, you know, in the election in the US probably, why Clinton was rejected by some people, because to some extent, the, the system was rejected. The system where those politicians were lifelong politicians, you know, uh, if you look at, um, you know, somebody like uh, Fillon or Hamon, those people, those people have never worked in, in private companies. They have never had a job outside, you know, political life. So those people are, are political for life. And the impression of people is, well, their job is to get reelected, is not to serve, <laughs> you know, the public interest. And they have some posture. So if you are from Parti Socialist, you will systematically vote against the law proposed by the Republican and vice versa, you know. And that's, you know, that's what we don't like. You know, we want, we, we don't understand why people cannot agree on uh, things that are quite obviously of common interest. So that's the first reason. So people wanted to get rid of that. Those people, they are disconnected from real life. They don't know the price of basic food. They don't understand that you shouldn't do that. You know, they, uh, and, and, uh, and Macron had predicted what would happen. He had predicted that the primary would lead to, to have, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a candidate that would not be popular, program that could not be uh, implemented, and, and he had anticipated the end of this system. And he was the candidate saying, we need to have more breathing between uh, the actual economy, or the society, and, and the world of, uh, of politics. So that's the first reason why people uh, were pretty much interested in, in, uh, in him. The, the second one is what I call uh, integrative thinking. Integrative thinking, maybe you know this curve. Uh, this curve is an uh, elephant curve, you know, you know maybe, s maybe some of you know. It's ba basically showing this over 20 years, but over the last decade, how the, um, if you take zero here, and that's the percentile of global income distribution, and you see how the in, you know, income has increased over 20 years. So you, you can see that this basically here, well the very poor are still very poor, 10% you know, are still. But the, the in the 80s, the 10% represented maybe 40 or 50% of the world population was very poor. Now it's 
only, it's still a lot, a lot of people, but it's only 10%. Most of the people here, that's the growing middle class of emerging countries, specifically China or India. And those people have really benefited from globalization. Here on the top, you have the 10% the richest. So those, those people have also benefited from globalization. And here in this kind of, you know, uh, eighth or ninth uh, uh, decile, so 85 percentile, this is, uh, those are the people who, who, who have voted maybe for Trump or, or who in France were pretty much attracted by, by the vote or of extreme right. Those people have the impression that compared to 20 or 30 years ago, their situation has gone much more, much, uh, much worse and uh, less, uh, less stable, more risky. And those people are pretty much afraid of, uh, of uh, glo globalization. And, and this is true in countries where you have unemployment, like France, or this is true also in, in countries where you don't have unemployment, like, uh, like uh, in the US. So he was the first one to say, uh, just having a good economy, you know, with growth, with GDP growth, and is not enough. We need to give more solidarity. So we are not here to protect the, the jobs, because this is impossible. Some jobs will disappear. Some sectors are going to be uh, completely disrupted, but we are here to protect the people. So he came with really uh, uh, this idea of liberalism with uh, solidarity. And that's uh, one of the reasons why I think he, he was successful both on the right side and the left side, and he can today have a government. And, uh, and this idea is not half of right and left. So that's a book I really recommend from uh, Roger Martin. He's a um, Canadian guy from, uh, you know, I think, I think he was the, the dean of, uh, of uh, Toronto uh, uh, MBA University. Uh, it's called The Opposable Mind. It's not, uh, it's integrative thinking. It's not uh, the average of, of two solutions, but it's, the, go it's uh, the sum of the good points of solution. And I think that's pretty much what, uh, what Macron could achieve. And the third one is, um, is a program for the 21st century. As I explained earlier, the, twenti the 21st century with digitalization is going to bring even more risk, even more uncertainty, and is the, is the one who say, we need to change the status. Today we, have, we are managing the job by status. If you, are in the, if, you, if you work for train company, national railway company, if you work for government, if you work for, uh, if you are in the agriculture, if you work in the automotive industry, you, you always have a different system for unemployment, for training, for uh, retirement and so on. In the future, you will have to change jobs all the time. So we need to bring uh, a more safety net and we need to, to manage the people, not to manage the job. Because the job will change and the people must adapt to, to, to the job. And in his program, there was a big, big part on the uh, digitalization, both in terms of investment, infrastructure, but also in terms of structure itself of the, the society. So I think those are the three reasons which we heard a lot from our members, why people really join him and why he, he became he became so popular in such a such a short uh, such a short time i think that's all thank you very much guillaume um now i'll give the floor to regis and first i have to give you the mic um, maybe i'll stand well good evening my name is uh, regis arnaud uh, I'm the correspondent of Le Figaro. I'm the editor of France Japon Echo, and I've been in Japan for uh, 22 years. And Robert uh, kindly asked me uh, to, 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 to participate in this event, and I was very... Uh, first, I refused because I thought I'm just a voter, so I'm, I don't have much to say. But then he said to me, but you can talk about populism and the uh, difference between Europe, Asia, the US, and so forth. And this I found very interesting, and I accepted because... Um, so my speech will be quite uh, off. I mean, I will not, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I have not prepared very much, but I've been thinking about this topic for a very long time. And um, uh, wh what really is, was interesting for me in this election is that really I felt I lived in a kind of, uh, how would I say, a kind of uh, alternative reality, or uh, to use a word, uh, a diffraction, or diffracted reality. And this was really, uh, uh, fascinating to me during the debate, the second debate of the second round between uh, Emmanuel Macron and uh, Shinzo Abe. Of course, my mistake is on purpose. It was Marine Le Pen who was, who was on the floor. But really, I mean, Marine Le Pen, to me, the more she was talking, and the more I felt I have in front of me, actually, Shinzo Abe. 
and we can take the topic one after the other. Uh, I mean, I am anti-immigration. Well, I mean, Shinzo Abe even refused to, to talk about immigration. He says he, he does not want uh, immigration policy. I don't want refugees. Well, uh, Japan received 27 refugees last year. And France received something like, uh, I don't know, five to 10,000. I am for uh, historical revisionism. After all, uh, I mean, in, in Algeria, France did not act so badly, and colonialism had its good points and its bad points, and we should not uh, lash at, uh, at, at, at oneself. I am for death penalty. After all, people should be, a uh, state should be allowed to, to kill someone if, if he feels he has the right to. I am for state capitalism. If a factory is in danger, or if a group like Toshiba uh, is on the verge of dying, the government should uh, uh, jump in and try to save it and save the workers. I am for having my own currency. And Japan is constantly talking about the yen, is it up, is it down? Um, and you can, you can follow, you can go on and on, uh, team after team after team, and to me, and I, I really would love to hear your, your thoughts about that, uh, there is really not much that, that differentiates the bad guy in this election or the bad girl, uh, Marine Le Pen, or actually Trump. I mean, when you listen to Trump, Trump would say there are, there are too many immigrants, uh, I'm for jobs, uh, America first, and so forth. I mean, that's, what, that's the position of, uh, of Japan in general. And so to me, it was very strange because I would meet some Japanese journalist who would say to me, I especially I remember one who, who came to me at the French embassy and without me talk, he saw on my business card I was a journalist and he started giving to me his opinion about Le Pen without me asking anything. And he said, you know, I think there is a, there's a, there's a risk. But I said, do you realize you live under Le Pen in Japan? Or? <laughs> The, the, isn't it, uh, the, doesn't it bother you that the, all the teams, all the issues defended by Le Pen are actually the issues that are actually implemented every day? And he paused for a while and he said, actually, you're right, because uh, once I interviewed uh, Bruno Golnisch, who is like the number three or four of, uh, of National Front, and Bruno Golnisch is a professor of uh, Japanese civilization, and his wife is Japanese, and he's pretty often in, in Japan. And he said, so I interviewed Bruno Goldnisch, and actually, he, when I arrived in this office, he said, my model is Japan. <laughs> and uh, and, you, and you, if you look, if you dig a little bit, you will find that many nationalists have Japan as a model. Uh, Viktor Orban, for example, in Hungary, uh, who stayed for, uh, for a couple of weeks in Japan a while ago, and whom I, I met once in, uh, there, was a, there was a congress of the far rights uh, in Yasukuni a couple of years ago. And Orban was there, and, and Le Pen was there, and Goldnisch was there. And they were very happy in, in Japan. They felt, wow, this is, if I were a political refugee, I would end up in Japan. I mean, this country really thinks like, like me. And if you think of it, I mean, people like Putin or, uh, or, or Trump again, or Le Pen, uh, I mean, if, Le, if Abe and Le Pen were in a Swiss chalet after a snowstorm and they had a dinner together, at the end of the dinner, Marine Le Pen would say, this guy is really far right. I mean, <laughs> I, I, would never, I would never be able to, to defend everything he just told me. I mean, death penalty and uh, 27 refugees and no immigrants and uh, uh, no, uh, no, no uh, historical uh, uh, forgiveness or repentance or whatever. And Shinzo Abe would say, this woman is really left. I mean, she's really, her hand is really weak. And, um, and I was talking to, about that to my, to my wife, and she pointed out to me that, I don't know if you know uh, Andres, Anders Breivik. Anders Breivik was, um, he's, you know, the killer in Norway who killed 68 people. Uh, he, shoot, he shot 68 people, and he put a bomb that killed nine more. And just before killing all these people, he put, uh, on his website, he put a manifesto. And what does he say in the manifesto? He comments Japan for not allowing Muslims to immigrate, although the country has no ban on ethnic groups. And then he says, he would like to meet former minister Taro Aso, because he has been quoted as praising Japan for having one nation, one civilization, one language, one culture, and one race. So for him, the most far right a person, I mean the most, I mean the, a, a killer, the Japanese is model, it's pretty, I find it pretty uh, scary. 
And it really uh, surprised me because <laughs> Japan has a kind of pass on this. Uh, so Abe, after the election, called Macron to congratulate him. He didn't call Moon, by the way. He didn't call the, the South Korean guy because maybe he thinks he's, uh, he's not so important. But Macron, he called. And he put a, a press release saying that uh, uh, with uh, France, we share democracy, human rights, uh, we fight against protectionism. And he, you know, <laughs> you read that, you're like, really? <laughs> you share the value of Macron because Macron said that, for example, he praised uh, Germany for allowing one million refugees uh, during the Syrian, two million refugees? Okay, well, two million refugees during the crisis. Do you share the same values, really? So you think you, you can get a long way? And I asked this, uh, and the, the most funny thing was the front page of the Sanke Shimbun, which is, of course, is far right. And Sanke, the, the headline was, it's a victory uh, of, of Europe against the far right. Sanke Shimbun, okay? Uh, <laughs> and so I asked the question to, um, I interviewed um, a diet member called uh, Takao Ochi, who is from LDP, and who is the kind of one of the defenders of abenomics. And, I to and he's, he's lived in France as a, as a, as a student. And I asked him, but do you, do, don't you think Japan is a, is a little bit like what actually Marine Le Pen wishes it were? And he, s he paused for a while and he said, yeah, you're right. But the difference is Marine Le Pen wants chaos. We don't want chaos. Oh, okay, so it's a polite Marine Le Pen. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ordinate Marine Le Pen. And uh, he laughed and he said, yeah, maybe you're right, actually. And I talked about that with, um, so with Nikkei journalists who, uh, who, are, uh, who did a report on, on immigration. And I asked them the same question. You know, Japan now has, Japan has seven nurses uh, offers for one demand. Which means, and basically they refuse immigration if they had, mm, of course, nursing is a hard job and you need language and skills, but they basically refused immigrants, which to me means that Japanese people prefer to die <laughs> than to be helped by nurses. I mean, there are many nurses all over the place, who could, I mean, all over Asia, who could, who could come and, and help Japan, and like, but they don't. And, and for me, it's, it's very, um, it's a kind of diffraction that I see every day I'm here, and that is more and more uh, 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 striking. And uh, as a conclusion, I, I would say that if we feel, if, Jap if the world is tilting towards the right now, after having tilted to towards the left for the last, uh, I would say, since the early 70s, then Japan maybe uh, look like the future, actually, politically, because and I know Robert has, has uh, the same themes about uh, nationalistic, uh, uh, I mean, Japan as a, as a Sakoku uh, economy. Um, maybe Japan actually looks like the future of humanity. And on this note, I will leave the floor and <laughs> welcome your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Regis. Uh, well, I mean, since the population is declining as the future of humanities, there won't be any humanity left. Uh, I think one difference, perhaps, between Le Pen and Abe comes in how they justify the system. I think the justification that Japanese conservatives have comes from the top. You know, the, the emperor, the state, the establishment. I mean, Abe, like all Japanese conservatives, are very attached to the system, you know, the big universities, the big corporations. Uh, populism in Europe of the Le Pen type, of the P Trump type, legitimacy comes from the people. In this sense, it's much more similar to fascism. It's from the bottom. I mean, what Le Pen said, I mean, if you think of somebody like Abe, you know, he appoints members to a committee. He always loves to have some honorary professor from Tokyo University, honorary chairman of this. When Trump appoints a committee, the last thing he wants is somebody from Harvard or Princeton. You know, he wants, I mean, to be qualified for, by Trump's standards is very different. And I think for Le Pen, to Le Pen's idea is not, well, we'll have someone from the Collège de France to show that my economic policies are right. So I think that's kind of a difference. But I agree, the result is in many ways uh, very similar. Um, so we'll open the floor for questions. And uh, you can also ask questions to Benjamin. You, you, you hear us, Benjamin? Yeah. Yeah, you're here. That's good. Um, so if you have a question, uh, raise your hand and then walk to the mic over there. 
So you'll be recorded. If you don't want to be recorded, you speak from the. You can speak if you want to be recorded for eternity. Oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, this is Japan, you're not France, so uh, they won't put me in prison. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think you made a great point about that in Japan we live under Le Pen, and I love it, I must say. So I'm not into this globalist thing. Um, but I guess I know the, most of the elites are. Um, before I came here, I just, uh, because I didn't know much about, about Macaron, so I, I, I just uh, went to the internet and I printed out the party program of, of um, this Le Marche. And... Um, I think it's, it's uh, I can read French, I cannot speak it. But Do you have a question? Uh, sorry? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I get to the question now. Yeah. It, it sounds like uh, reading Santa Claus, he has money for everything. I can just assume he took the bank of the Rothschild, uh, the key of the Rothschild bank with him. Um, my question is regarding, um, what's this, page uh, 15. Uh, he says he is going to hire 5,000 more policemen to protect European borders. My question is, uh, 5,000 is a ridiculous number. Which borders are you talking about? And how do you, defi how do you find protect? Considering that, that the EU, that for example Italy, the it Italian Navy's job is to ferry refugees into Europe. So there's no protection going on. Like, um, and Merkel has already said, Germany is open to everybody. So the next five million from Libya and, uh, e and Turkey on the way. So how do you define protect and where, where what? What are these 5,000 people going to do? Thank well, you. I, I'm, I'm not going to answer on this spe specific point because I'm not... Uh, uh, no, I think uh, what he said, basically, because uh, uh, there was a big discussion on uh, whether, whether you can... Uh, because the, the, the question was whether you, you, you should go back to the border of France or whether you want to, to, to keep the border of Europe. Yeah, yeah. No, but I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I, I, I know this point. <laughs> Thank you. I know the program. And, uh, and basically, what he answers is say it's much easier to protect the border of Europe than just the border of France, because uh, compared to the to the population. Yeah. That is, actu that is actually what the EU law says. Yes. That refugees should be checked when they enter. Yes. Yes, we know that. And he said that rather than uh, going back to the border of France, which, by the way in exceptional cases is, uh, is possible. He proposed to create a special force of uh, maybe 5,000 that could uh, intervene in, uh, in, in special cases like you know, when, when you have an, uh, uh, many, many refugees uh, coming. But that's, as you say, that's just one, one of the points of the program. Uh, so I think the, the, the point you need to, to remember is that uh, you want to protect and to reinforce the protection at European level rather than trying to make a kind of fake protection of a uh, French border. That's, uh, that's the point. Yes, please. Yeah. I have a question. Oh, do you want to come to me? No, no. Uh, we will. Yeah. I want to confirm what you mentioned that um, he did a 35,000 people walking interview. <laughs> then, then after that, he made a vision then you know you, you could you tell me more details about the sequence well, the the sequence is at first he asked uh, the workers to go on the an interview i think it was 35000 in total interviews maybe it was more than that and based on that there was uh, uh, what we called the uh, atelier de restitution du diagnostic so there were some workshop to, to establish a diagnosis, and that took, uh, here it was kind of summary, and this diagnosis was made over the, over the summer, and based on the diagnosis, he made, uh, of course, he had already, that's what I say, it's a combination of top-down and bottom-up, but based on the diagnosis, the diagnosis enriched his vision, and then he published the book in November, I think 24th of, of November, the book is called Revolution, and this book describes his vision, so his vision came after the, the diagnosis. I've, I'm not sure. I can check, but uh, uh, I, I, I don't have the answer. I will check on uh, and the book, 24th of November, called Revolution. He explained his vision. And, uh, and based on the vision, uh, we at here committee, all the 3,000 committee in France and abroad, we received by theme. So we had a theme, one week on environment, one week on culture, one week on, on education. And we had some uh, very practical questions. So we had to make some debate. 
and, and we had to answer some very practical questions. And that lasts from maybe December, January, and, uh, and first part of February. And based on that, he did the detailed program, which, uh, which you have here. So there was question on security, there were questions on economy, and so on. Of course, we had a team, I think, of uh, 200 experts, specialists, under the authority of one uh, economist called uh, Pisani Ferry, who, uh, who uh, I would say, formalized this, uh, this program into those, uh, those detail points. But it was enriched also by the, by the, by the bottom-up of the committee. So every time you have top-down vision combined with bottom-up uh, uh, people's opinion to make sure that you get the best of the two. If you're looking for stuff in English, generally the best coverage of, uh, of, of French politics in English is in the Financial Times. That's probably the thing to read. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I, uh, I understood how enthusiastic uh, French, pr uh, French people are about their future. Then now I wonder, um, uh, p politicians from uh, established parties uh, thinking about uh, what they will do uh, from now, because uh, are they do they realize the the uh, eagerness of French people for their future and support uh, Mr. Macron or against against him uh, to uh, expand their uh, support? <laughs> so B Benjamin, can you hear us? Yeah. Yeah. That's, so, do you that's, think that's the mainstream? Po what, yeah. what What are the lessons which the mainstream politicians have taken from this? Well, I think they understand right now that they have to profoundly reinvent themselves. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a completely new political landscape that's um, th that's shaping up in France after the election of of Macron. For instance, within the Socialist Party, um, there's going to be a clear division between the kind of center-left reformist socialists who clearly recognize themselves in Macron's program and are going to try to help him in the next five years. And then there's going to be a, the hardliners, more kind of far-left, Amon Mélenchon tendency that is probably going to, to coalesce on their own end. Within the conservatives also, they have serious questions about their future. Emmanuel Macron um, just uh, appointed... Uh, a center-right prime minister, and that's a clear signal to the um, to the center-right voters saying, "I'm including your your perspective and your vision in my government." And then the Republicans are going to have to make the same uh, decision: Do they decide? Do the moderate conservatives decide to join Macron to help him out to serve in government? And we're going to see that in in a few hours when government is announced. And then you're probably going to have the hardliners who are going to say, "No, Macron's program is center-left. It's the continuity of François Hollande." And we don't uh, recognize ourselves in this. We need to keep our, our own line. The, the other point to bear in mind is that there's going to be a profound um, renewal of the National Assembly, the, the lower house of parliament. Uh, about 35% of um, French MPs are not running for office again. And a lot of them are actually abandoning the race, saying, I realize that there is such a profound desire for renewal and they also probably see Macron's score in their constituency if they're not en marche, if they're of one major party or the other, and realize that it's probably a lost cause in any case. So I think both at the government level, uh, from the perspective of the voters and in parliament, there is a sense that not only is the landscape completely changing, the kind of tectonic plates are shifting every single day. And, you know, in, in three months, we're probably going to have a a system that's very different to the one we had a few months ago, if Macron's plan succeeds. It's interesting, Regis, when you think of it, that Japanese politics doesn't seem to have been shaken up. I mean, the DPJ takes over, but then you know, we're back uh, to normal. So <laughs> why is Japan, in a way, so stable? Uh, I think, <coughs> I think the, the mm, maybe, um, I, I remember once, um, a discussion with uh, with the former French ambassador about how how politics in Japan are local and how you tied to your to your family to your uh, to your daimyo basically to your uh, to your local area and really it's me I mean I'm from uh, Sapporo I'm from Fukuoka and so forth 
And I think Japan is a pre-politic world in the sense that, as we know, the, the, the politics starts when you, when you say who is left, who is right. And I think at this stage, people still don't define themselves by these criteria. They define their, their group, their, their posse, really, <laughs> their, their band. Uh, and in this respect, so it's still the same families running uh, the, the, the same the same institution. But I'm not sure it, it's that Japanese. I think uh, uh, the other day I was hearing Emmanuel Todd explaining that the Northern Germany uh, uh, has also, I mean, uh, basically the power never changed in in in, in, so in Northern Northern Europe. It's very rare that power has changed over the last century, and uh, and many countries are actually like that. We had, uh, yes, I think here and then you. So this here and then, okay, and then after. So one, two, three. Uh, hello, thank you for coming today. I was just curious. Uh, what do you predict the outcome of the Brexit negotiations will be on Le Pen's support base in 2022? Harold, Harold Wilson uh, famously said, late uh, British Prime Minister, twice Prime Minister, said a week is a long time in politics. And I think to think about 2022 and the Brexit negotiations and elections in France is really way, way beyond the, the horizon, even if you have a, a long-range radar. I don't know if anybody wants to add something on this. No, I think uh, I, I, I would rather agree. I'm not a politician. I'm not a politics expert, but when you see that Macron one year ago was nowhere and, and he, he, he got president, so it's very difficult to, uh, to forecast. What is, what is sure is that uh, those, fi those coming five years are going to be critical for, for many reasons. One, because this, uh, you know, as Benjamin explained, you don't have this uh, Republican uh, front anymore. Now, now some people, I had lunch with, with a French guy who said, you know, he voted for, for Le Pen, which probably a few years ago would have been a kind of shame, you know, you would, you would have hidden it. Now people are, are quite open and, uh, about it. So I think if, uh, if those coming five years are not going to be successful, I, I think the what until recently was considered impossible might become possible. And also Marine Le Pen, I think, didn't do a, a she did a very, very poor campaign because she, she ended up with less than at the beginning, even though she passed the, the first round. And also what's going to, to happen in the coming five years, I mean, the acceleration of the digital revolution in such areas as, uh, you know, industry, banking, uh, transportation, and so on, is going to put even more people's jobs at risk. So if the politicians don't find the solution, I think there this kind of attraction of populism, of, of protectionism, or you know, kind of nationalism might uh, might increase. But that's just uh, my my prediction. As as Robert says, it's very difficult to. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. No, you you yeah you, you and then you yes. No, you 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 were second and then uh, yeah. That. My question is yeah. to uh, Mr. Lassery in London. You mentioned that the abstention rate was 25.4%, the figure, I think you said. I'm curious, yeah. this abstention rate is among people who are qualified or were qualified to vote, or is it the rate of people that dropped so-called white votes or unmarked ballots? So the 25.4% um, is... Uh, is actual abstention, which means that they they did not show up to vote. Um, the blank or spoiled ballots, I'm just putting up the slide, was 11.5%. So abstention is, as you said, you just don't turn up and decide, you know, either because you didn't vote in the first round or you voted in the first round and you didn't like the option you had in the runoff, so you just don't show up to vote at all. The 11.5% is you show up to vote, either you don't put anything in the envelope or you spoil your ballot and it's going to be counted as null. So it, it is an extremely high rate if you look at both the 25.4% of abstention and the 11.5% of blank ballots. And that ties back to the um, to the point we I briefly discussed about how voters reacted in the runoff when their candidate didn't make it in the first round. There was a strong split in terms of the Fillon and Mélenchon voters and 
um, for a number of those voters, the preferred option was not to take position for, for either candidate. And this was in part fueled by both the conservatives and, and the far left. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Sure. You're here and then, yeah. Thank you. My name is uh, Yukio Kashiyama. I am a former uh, chief editorial bureau of Sankei Shimbun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my comment or uh, my question is, uh, Mr. Ch Channelist, the uh, speech. Well, you mentioned the headline of our company, the history for the far right. Uh, well, I don't remember the exact uh, headline by myself. I'm so sorry, although I'm a reporter from uh, Sankei Shimbun. But then, uh, um, well, you sounded to feel a little bit strange about our headline. Uh, even Sankei Shimbun, you said. Why you think like that? Because we are very far right. Okay. Basically, what your speech was very interesting. Uh, that, uh, I enjoy to hear uh, your speech, and uh, sometimes uh, Japanese uh, people or Japanese media discuss the political situation of France without uh, enough uh, information. You are right. I think uh, I should have a, a self-reflection uh, as a journalist. But however, however, regarding with uh, our newspaper, well, probably, uh, ladies and gentlemen, including in this room, in, in, including ladies and gentlemen in this room, how many people uh, believe that uh, Sanke Shimbun is uh, like uh, far right or ultra conservative or right wing? It is good chance uh, right now for me to express. Okay, our paper is conservative. That's true, but we hate the right wing or ultra right wing or ultra conservative. Well, I think if you carefully list, uh, read our newspaper, probably you will find out we don't support the any any uh, right wing or any ultra conservative. We write just a uh, right thing. And uh, <laughs> well, probably there's some of the people, uh, leader of uh, Sankei Shimbun. I hope that you uh, understand, understanding uh, our policy, editorial policy of Sankei Shimbun. That's what I want to tell you. Thank you for your comment. Um, what would I say? Uh, I, but then, then we have to define what is right wing. I mean, I, I, I mean, you can say right wing is conservative, and you are perfectly entitled to have your views. In some case, to me, as respectable as Akahata or Yomiuri. Uh, no, don't, 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 uh, don't get me wrong. But to, uh, if I had to place somewhere Sanke on a scale, I would say Sanke is rather right. And I guess you would agree, or conservative. But I would say, if I had to, to, to sum up my speech, I would say Japan is a reactionary country in the sense that it always wants to conserve. And in this respect, I feel Mr. Abe is from the same intellectual family as your newspaper, I would say, in general. I think you would have uh, a lot of things to, to agree on with the current prime minister. Don't you agree? More than with uh, people bef behind him. Our editorial policy, uh, our idea is the same with the prime minister. Also, it, it, it is a good chance. A uh, lot of uh, people say that, oh, uh, Sankyo Shinbun is uh, so called chochimochi uh, in uh, Japanese slang, Japanese slang. It's uh, like uh, some sort of like a special supporter of uh, uh, prime minister Abe. But it's not uh, true. We, we write, we have been writing same thing from many, many years ago, before Prime Minister Abe came to the power. Since he was a young boy, we are writing the same thing. 
we are not uh, we are not uh, yes and uh, support and uh, intentionally the Prime Minister Abe, but uh, just just our idea and Prime Minister Abe the idea is the same. Mm. So that, that's a coincidence. Mm. Uh, I know you were very. I know Sanke was very harsh uh, on the Moritomo scandal, Moritomo Gakuen scandal. So I understand you're not their puppet, but uh, I agree with you. So we have uh, one question of a gentleman in blue in the back, and then Meguro san. So, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, nice presentation. Very fascinating to listen to. Uh, I have a very simple question about Mr. Mr. Macron. Uh, to what and is he a strong? Will we? Will he be a strong, a strong president? Um, we don't know, but we'd like to know the assessment at this moment. And I think the case is uh, particularly interesting, given the other example in the UK, where the Labour, the, the you know, the Labour Party is very much divided, and the left wings are basically you not know, very strong at this moment. So this comparison, I think, could be also interesting. Thank you. Is there, really, uh, is there a question per se? Oh, sorry. Ah, that, uh, in the simpler term, we Macron strong as a president. The assessment. Well, I, th I think it's it, well. He's been president for two days, so it's all. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, I know I nobody think. knows about the, at this moment. What I, do you I think, think about it? I mean, Donald Trump after two days, he knew where he was because yeah. you know, this was a psychiatric issue, uh, <laughs> but. In, 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 I think in Macron's case, it's a political analysis issue. So I don't know if anybody wants to comment on the first two days, the nomination <laughs> of the prime minister, or Benjamin, you want to say something on how his first I mean, two I days think, have gone? I, I think if the question is, will he be a strong president? I yeah, think yeah. Um, uh, the the outcome of the legislative elections will be interesting uh, if he gets a majority in the the in in the national assembly on June eighteenth then clearly it's going to put him in a position to be um, a strong president in that he has, he controls parliament and then he can implement his platform. If he falls short of that and has to enter into coalition discussions or simply, you know, has to kind of broaden his appeal and to amend his platform, then that's going to be a sign that he doesn't start on as strong a footing as as what he hoped. So um, maybe in, 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 in a few weeks we'll be will have a, a better idea about that. I think in, in terms of style, yeah. I think he probably understands that he has to look, as he put it, very Jupiterian, yeah. referring, because it's only that he's very young, but he's never held political office, so he comes to power with a very, very thin CV. I mean, if you think of like when Jacques Chirac became president, Chirac had been twice prime minister, he'd been yeah. mayor of Paris, head of a major political party. So when you arrive as a novice in that job, you have to compensate by being, in a way, particularly tough. You really have to show you're the boss. Uh, because you, otherwise, yeah. it, obviously a lot of politicians who are not only older than you, but have a lot more experience are going to think, well, this is just a young kid who is lucky. Yeah. And it's true, he was extremely lucky. So he has, I think, to compensate by being harsher, tougher, uh, in a way meaner, than if he <laughs> were, say, 60, had spent three years as prime minister, 20 years in, in the National Assembly, 10 years in the government. So in that sense, I think the style is going to be very much, I'm the boss. Uh, so it's so kind of the pop, a sort of a populist style. No, way, no. no. Not necessarily. I think, I, I think we, we have some clues already from how he, how he behaved when he was Minister of, uh, of Economy. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, why people uh, uh, also adhere to his, uh, his party and his ideas. You know, he, 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 he spent, I think, 500 hours. There was a law called Loi Macron to liberalize the, liberalize the, the, the French economy, uh, which didn't go as far as he wanted it to, to go for, because there was a lot of internal uh, opposition in the, in the majority of that time. Mm. But uh, he spent five, 500 hours, I think, uh, debating in the French Assembly mm -hmm. in total. And uh, and he showed that uh, he was ready to fight, to spend time, mm. and he really stick to the main ideas. And you know some things like uh, opening 
department store in Paris, for example, on, on, on Sunday, which was something that has been discussed for decades, mm -hmm. which in any other country would be very simple. Well, he did it. You go to, you go to Paris now, you mm -hmm. will see that all department stores are open on Sunday. Mm -hmm. you, you will, you know, for, ex for example, having competition of uh, coaches uh, uh, against the, the, the train uh, kind of monopoly, which is very mm -hmm. strong, uh, very strong, uh, I would say, uh, territory for the communist trade unions. You know, he could also uh, get to that, and on on many other many other smaller items, mm -hmm. in very hostile environment, he could get some some kind of result. So I think that I agree with uh, Robert. If he has the majority, mm -hmm. I think he will definitely be, be very strong. At least that's my conviction. Thank you very much, uh, Miguel San. Okay, I'm Hiroshi uh, Miguel, and. Uh, I I cover uh, I'm a freelancer and uh, I cover mainly Okinawa, you know. and so uh, Okinawa and France are quite different. And so uh, I'm I, I'm not really familiar with the French issues. But uh, well, um, my question is a about the relations between uh, his strong uh, Mr. Macron's strong strength and uh, his uh, policies. And uh, um, I got the impression that, uh, um, well, he became very uh, rapidly, he became a star you know, and in a very, very short time. And so uh, it's a kind of, uh, uh, well, because of um, his style and uh, top-down plus grassroots kind of things, you know, and it's a kind of cool kind of uh, uh, election campaign strategy. But how about the yeah. content of the policies? And uh, yeah, uh, for instance, the, uh, the guests uh, mentioned uh, the visions and so on and so forth, and plans, programs, and so on. But now, um, well, typical case is a Trump uh, phenomenon, but uh, globalization and techno technological developments, uh, well, in a way, steal jobs from people, and a lot of people are losing jobs, and so on and so forth. And so, a lot of people are worried about their future. And so, what's the answer uh, of the to the those uh, you know frustrations and problems? And so, uh, do you have any? Uh, did, did he show any model? in other countries, like a German model or a Swedish model or a totally different kind of model. Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, again, uh, I'm not an expert of, uh, of politics, but uh, from, what I, uh, from what I heard, from what I read, it's definitely the Swedish model. Is, if there is one model, it's probably a Swedish model. And, uh, and as, I said, uh, as I said earlier, um, I think that... Uh, he said you cannot protect the jobs that will disappear. So to some extent, you can maybe postpone. But uh, if a job has to disappear, you know, it has to disappear. And, uh, and you have to protect people, not job. Okay. I, I think In the also case one, one issue is that it's often perceived that a lot of these job losses come from globalization. In other words, they've been exported. But the truth is, and, and Rick Katz, uh, who is his colleague for many years, pointed out a lot of it is due to technological progress, to automation. In other words, even without trade, a lot of these jobs would have been lost because you just require yeah, sure. fewer workers to produce steel, to produce automobiles. Mm. I mean, you know, we see this in day, daily life. I mean, when I started working, uh, first job I had was in 1984. Uh, as a very junior person out of college, I was sharing one secretary with another colleague. Mm. And mid-level to senior people had one secretary per professional. Now, you know, unless you're extremely senior, you're the CEO, no one has a single secretary. I mean, a lot of secretarial jobs are gone mm. because, you know, we, we, are, we have computers on our desks, we have mm. smartphones, and you just don't need someone in the old days, you know, you'd come in, secretary would say, guy would give dictation and she'd take notes on a pad and then sure, type yeah. it, that's over. And these jobs haven't been outsourced to India or to Vietnam, they're gone. Mm. They're gone, they've been replaced by other jobs. And I, I think that's one of the problems and one thing that explains, one of the things of the failure of 
those who lost during the remain of the, the Brexit campaign of, uh, of Clinton yeah. was to explain this mm. and to basically let the Brexiters or the Trumpists win the argument which was actually based on false data. Mm. That is, it's, you're not going to make America great again by, what are you, are you going to say, well, <laughs> now, you know, we, we're going to remove tractors from farms so we'll have more farm workers. I mean, that mm. would work. Mm -hmm. uh, but no one really wants to do it because you have to pay more for your food. So I think mm -hmm. that's one issue. But sorry, you had a, one more question. So oh yeah, no, 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 I'd say a follow-up uh, question because, you know, um, I, I, I know that uh, the, the, you know, the society is changing very, you know, on and on. And so uh, we need to accept uh, some changes. Um, but at the same time, uh, there, are, there are a lot of drop out, dropouts. And a lot of people talk, uh, talking out, and 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 then, um, you know, they suffer and frustration com, uh, coming out. And um, when you say that the Swedish Swedish model, uh, well, in the case of Sweden, uh, a lot of you, you need to pay a lot of tax. It's a big big government, and uh, so keep you know, welfare system. Oh, I see. Okay. So, you know, okay. So uh, I, I wondered, you know, uh, it, does it work? No. I think the, the, the idea, and I think this is something, again, Rick Katz often mentioned about Scandinavian models, is the idea that you let the market operate, and at the end you have the tax system and you also have significant investment in job training. That is, rather than saying, well, we're going to have a system that, protects inefficient farmers, we're just going to essentially let the market work and then we will compensate these people financially or through training so that they can get a better job. I think so the idea is that it's more efficient because you don't distort market uh, mechanisms, but you take into account the need for equity and fairness by, and so you have more taxes, but also you, you get more out of government. I think the question is, when you look at taxes, it's also what you get in exchange. I think, I think that, um, well, definitely what he wants to do is to reduce the, the public spending. That's very clear. He said uh, a decrease by 12 billion, uh, 12 billion euro per year. Uh, but he wants to increase investment in, as I said, infrastructure, digital infrastructure, uh, 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 energy transformation, new energies, and so on. And um, he doesn't believe in the, he's a liberal, he says he's a liberal, but at the same time he's a kind of equalitarian liberal. So he thinks that uh, the, the state still has a role, uh, especially, you know, I showed the, the elephant curve. If you, if you let the market only do, it's never going to work. You, you will end up with populism. In that sense, he thinks that the state has a role, not to invest in the economy. He doesn't say, well, it can be, I mean, uh, temporarily, but it's not to invest definitely in the economy. He doesn't think that uh, the the role of the state is to own its own car company, telecom companies, or whatever. So that's not at all. But to protect people, to make sure that the people who at some point in their life have some difficulty can have access to, to the right training, to the right uh, education, to the right protection in order to, to make things... Uh, uh, this transition, this digital transition happen as smoothly as possible. And also he wants to, he's very popular among uh, startups because he wants to create an ecosystem very favorable to startup. So that, uh, that he has been, as a minister of economy, he was very active in that. So he is really the, the most, uh, he was the most, uh, the favorite, even against uh, m more liberal in the entrepreneurs in France. So the entrepreneurs, he, he was really the favorite candidate for entrepreneurs because he really wants to create ecosystem to, to promote entrepreneurship. Thank you, uh, my name is uh, Murata. I'm very interested in uh, French politics. So the, um, uh, let me ask you two questions. And the uh, first one is uh, about Mr. Fillon. And uh, I still wonder how, why he prevailed in the campaign even after the revelation of uh, Penelope Gate. Uh, he had the uh, he or the Republican had the chance to change the candidates. Uh, go back to Mr. Juppé or uh, Mr. Sarkozy, 
but he prevailed. And uh, today, uh, the Republic is mainly uh, formed by the Sarkozists. And, uh, well, I don't know how they will stay in the political landscape. So if you, someone can uh, uh, respond. So, Benjamin, so why did, why did sure. he, when I was in Paris, I remember in February, everybody, including you know, friends, the journalists said, you know, Fillon's going to drop dead within the week. And yeah. well, he, he stayed, you know, he, he made it yeah. till the end. So how did he manage that? Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it was pretty extraordinary. Uh, Fillon was elected in the center um, right primary in November 2016. And it was very clear they would have their nominee in November, the election in April and May, and nothing was supposed to happen in between, especially not a, a financial scandal late January. What happened is that actually the, the, the statutes, the Articles of Association setting out the primary rules for the Conservatives did actually not have a, a plan B. There was nothing in the statutes which enabled them to replace a candidate, which means that the only way they could replace uh, François Fillon after the financial scandals was through political haggling and negotiation. So this was Fillon's strong argument, was to say, I have the legitimacy of something like five and a half million voters from the right, from the center who voted for me. I'm now the nominee and I've carried a very specific program through this primary that nobody else can defend as well as I can. And there's absolutely no legal alternative within the statutes to replace me. And this put the party in a very difficult position because they could um, either try to force him out. And there was almost a, a coup from uh, from the, the center-right uh, former prime minister, Alain Juppé, but he didn't go uh, to, to the end and decided not to not to step in. But the fact is, is that this program that Fillon defended in November was extremely kind of economically radical, almost Thatcherite, and no other politician within the party was, you know, was there, there was no heavyweight able to defend that same party line. So what they did in the end was think, well, you know, it's it's probably lost. At some point, Sarkozy even said uh, in private, according to some papers, that he knows it's lost, but um, they have to keep him. Fillon is obviously refusing to leave based on the legitimacy of the primary, and they just have to prepare for what uh, comes afterwards. So I think there is a lesson for lawyers working in political parties is that always have a plan B. You know, it's interesting that primaries uh, were started in the U.S. I mean, in, in, the six, in the 70s, 80s, the idea was you get, I mean, and before even that you get rid of smoke-filled rooms, same idea in France. And it seems if you think of the Republican primary in the U.S., both primaries in France for the Socialists and the Republicans, it produced what was, from their point of view, the worst candidate possible. That maybe the smoke-filled room, or at least now the f room without smoke, yep. uh, would have been a lot better. I think that uh, there is a lot to, to be learned. I speak under the control of uh, Benjamin. There is a lot to be learned about the, the primary because both the socialist and the Republicans primary uh, chose uh, a relatively extreme candidate. Uh, and, uh, and that gave a lot of room to, to Macron also. And even before, you know, I showed the, the, the poll, one of the poll in November, but already in January, even before the, the revelation of Penelope Gate, the, you know, the, the, the gap between, uh, between Fillon and Macron had already na narrowed down significantly. So maybe even without Penelope Gate, it's not said that, uh, that Macron would not have been elected. I'm, I'm difficult, to, difficult to judge. You don't know what would have happened. But the, the trend was not that favorable. And on the other side, on the socialist side, uh, Amon had uh, a kind of very extreme, even surprising to some uh, uh, program, w which was very much uh, influenced by Piketty, and uh, with a kind of uh, universal uh, income for everybody, whether you work or not, uh, which uh, you know uh, looked very, very artificial to many people. So on both sides, you had very extreme liberal, or with uh, you know half a million less civil servant, and so on. On the other side, very. I would say very socialist and very, uh, pro you know, kind of protective type of, uh, with m much more tax. Uh, 
So that gave that gave a lot of room I mean, in the middle for a program that would be at the same time liberal with uh, with solidarity, liberal and social. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yeah, uh, Tom. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I wanted to ask your opinions about the uh, the international implications of his election. For example, he's going to be joining the G7 immediately as a, as a member of the G7 committee, obviously, in France. I can just see himself and Justin Trudeau sitting on one side of the table and maybe Trump and Shinzo Abe on the other. So I'm just wondering what you think uh, you know, may evolve from that. And also in terms of Brexit and Russia, you know, obviously he was apparently hacked in the final stages of the election. Do you think he's going to take a very tough line on uh, on Putin. Um, thank you. You want to say as a journalist? Yeah. Well, I think the, the, a very um, a, a key of, of Macron is that he, uh, I don't know how to say in, in English, but he he's so young. He's, I mean, can you imagine? He's 39. I'm 46. And, uh, I feel like a loser. <laughs> Japan, in, Japan in the early Meiji era was governed by men who were younger than Macron. So I mean, Japan wasn't always a geriatric case when it came to <laughs> politics. Uh, it was actually leading the world in the 1870s in terms of young people running the country. But, yeah, now he looks more but so he looks very young and he has this uh, capacity to, to make everybody around him, in French we say, ringard. Uh, uh, old and uh, passé. Outdated, yeah. Uh, so can you imagine? Yeah, I, I think Trump is 74. If I'm correct, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> so everybody around him looks. I mean, I mean, Abe at that moment during the Abenomics, uh, when he arrived in late 2012, he was like the the flavor of the day, and uh, and Macron for for the next months will really be the, the flavor of the day. I don't know if you saw the image of his uh, when he got uh, he entered the Elysee Palace, but there is an image where he he climbed the, the Elysee stairs and he climbed two steps by two steps. Like really a, a kid, and I mean, can you imagine Trump and uh, and and people who are I mean Trump? So he's sixty, no, thirty, thirty-five years older than him. He really rep it suddenly everybody represents the old world, uh, and so he has this 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 positive, this Kennedy uh, uh, factor or whatever that will really I think turn the heads around, and which which which, which will probably be good for France. As for Putin, I have no expertise, but I, <laughs> I mean, from what I hear, when you're in front of Putin, it's pretty hard to, to, uh, to, to impose yourself. Uh, everybody has, has, has tried and everybody has failed. So he's a kind of master. Uh, he's maybe the most powerful man on earth today. So uh, and Macron is, is still a kid. I'm not sure he, if he can react to such a physical presence. I mean, I've talked to, to people near Putin. He's extraordinarily impressive, really. So I don't know. Well, I, I think we'll, 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 we'll see. Uh, I, I think it's, what's interesting, if you think of Macron, it really shows probably how the Democrats would have easily beaten Trump if they had gotten a, a candidate that was packaged much better. I mean, the way it's, I mean the, 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 that's what Obama would have done if he'd been able to run for re-election. That is that in terms of defeating populist candidates, you also need someone who has the right characteristics in terms of age, in terms of dynamism, in terms of looking new. Uh, and of course, the problem with Clinton, she was the opposite. She'd been in the public uh, limelight for a quarter of a century. She wasn't that young. Uh, she carried a lot of baggage. Um, she didn't have, and so that, I think, what it shows, I think, the Russia, in fact, I mean, from the point of view of, of Macron, is not a priority one way or the other. I mean, I think that's as simple as that. Uh, I mean, the priority, obviously, if you, is Europe. I mean, it's the EU, it's... It's a Eurozone management. I mean, it's, it's fundamentally uh, very Eurocentri Eurocentric. That plus, to some extent, Africa and the Middle East because French forces are there. So I'd like to thank all our panelists. Uh, so this is of the record in terms of quoting the panelists. If you want to quote them, just uh, ask them and uh, speak to them. Uh, Directly, we have uh, several events coming up, including a cybersecurity event with our adjunct fellow, Mio Masubala. Uh, next month uh, and several other um, events. Uh, if you're not, again, if you're not on our mailing list, uh, give us your business cards. Um, and also don't forget to make a donation. Uh, and uh, we, we promise that if uh, President Trump is impeached, we will have a session here. <laughs> uh, so thanks, Benjamin. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much.
And I'd like to thank Regis and, and Guillaume for kindly volunteering their time and their energy for this as well. Thank you. And thanks to Erico. Thank you, Erico is here. You're back. So without Erico and the student workers, we would never have this.